Welcome once again, and thank you for being with us this Sunday. For those of you who are still with us in our study and meditation and have been following this series on biblical faith, allow me to explain to you the significance of our study and meditation of Hebrews chapter 11 with the following. First, let me point out to you verses 1 to 6 of Hebrews 11 summarizes for us a key point in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. Let me state it in this way. God initiates and pursues fellowship with fallen humanity in spite of the infection and the corruption that sin and Satan brought upon mankind. We saw this in the walk of faith of the children of Adam and Eve, particularly Abel, Enoch, and Noah, during our study of Hebrews 11 verses 1 to 7. Today, we will start looking at the significance of our study and meditation for the remaining verses of Hebrews chapter 11. From verse 8 all the way to verse 40, we can summarize the rest of the chapter in this statement. God formalizes his redemptive plan for fallen humanity, beginning with the call of Abraham in Hebrews verse 8 all the way to the return of Christ and eternity. God's plan of salvation continues in the lives of the rest of the characters mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 all the way to the church age until Christ returns for the culmination of human history. Our study of Abraham's faith in Hebrews 11 verse 8 and the other characters mentioned all the way to us in verse 40 summarizes the rest of the Bible from Genesis chapter 12 all the way to the new heavens and the new earth in the book of Revelation. Brethren in Christ, let me point out also that since we started this series online, we have never asked you or prompted you to click the like or subscribe button because our main goal is not to become popular in Facebook or YouTube. Because we believe the essence of our online ministry is inspired by the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 1 verse 5, when he said, The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Our prayers and hopes through the Holy Spirit is that these studies and meditations of biblical facts and truths will stir up your spiritual hunger and enthusiasm to know more of God in Christ. And by the help of the Holy Spirit, be transformed to live like Christ in character and conduct so that our lives might serve God's purpose and proclaim His great love to a dying world through faith in Jesus Christ. So we can be biblical in our walk of faith, pleasing and useful to God's purposes for His glory till the end. Before we continue in the message from God's Word today, let us draw near to the Lord in humble worship. Redeemed through sacrifice 
In Him God has made known to us the mystery of His will. That I should be the head of all His purpose to fulfill. To the praise of Your glory, to the praise of Your mercy and grace, to the praise of Your glory. The God who saved. The praise and glory. By our God, for we believe the word, and through our faith we have a seal, the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit guarantees our hope until redemption's done, until we join in endless praise to God the three in one. To the praise of your glory, you are the God who saves. To the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace. To the praise of your glory, you are the God who saves. Praise God, our Father, and bless you all with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank God for another opportunity to be enriched by His Word today. Amen? So let's come into prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you as we join our hearts and our spirits today, may you speak to each one of us to enhance our knowledge, Lord, of you and your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit. Grant that worship and praise might overflow from our hearts as we see your glory in your word. Thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord, as we ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The title of our message today is Biblical Faith Described. And it describes the unwavering belief in God and His promises of Abraham. And regarding description, in the realm of employment, the clarity of job description is vitally important. Job description clarifies expectations immediately. Clarity of job descriptions ensure employee-employer expectations. They are crucial in bringing potential employees on the same page with management to be aligned with the company's vision and goal. I believe that such was God's desire as well when he had Hebrews chapter 11 written. God describes clearly in this chapter what and how our life of faith should be lived so we can be useful and fruitful for his vision and purpose in the goal of redemption in Christ Jesus. 
In our passage today, we will be focusing on Abraham. And let's read our passage first in Hebrews 11 from verse 8 to 19. But I will only be reading up to verse 12. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed God by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man and in him as good as dead at that as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. As we focus on Abraham today, let me start off by uh, sharing with you some of God's description of Abraham in the Bible. Are you aware that James chapter 2 verse 23 records the fact that Abraham was called the friend of God? And have you noticed that even the first verse in the New Testament begins by mentioning Abraham's name? And you find that in Matthew chapter 1 verse 1. In the Bible, Abraham is presented to us as a great example and description of a man who lived his life by faith. It is not surprising that Abraham receives more verses than any of the characters that live by faith mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Abraham's story is the beginning of God's formal implementation of his redemptive plan in Christ. The formal implementation of God's redemptive plan in Christ begins with Abraham. The first step in bringing the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God, who will take away the sin of the world, begins with God's call and promise to Abraham. And did you know that Abraham is revered by over one half of the world's population? being held in high esteem by Jews, by Muslims, and Christians alike. Those of you who are watching right now and listening to this video, this story of Abraham will affect the outcome of yours and my eternal destiny, including the eternal destiny of your family, your neighbors, and friends, even peoples and nations for generations until, until the return of Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? And that's why if there is even a smallest chance that this is all true, then all the more we should really pay attention. In Abraham, biblical faith is described as an unwavering belief in God and His promises. And so, here in Hebrews chapter 11, as we have read the beginning part, 
Abraham also referred as Abram or Ibrahim is the first and most prominent example of faith in God's plan of salvation. How did God describe biblical faith in Abraham? God shows us that biblical faith is an unwavering expectation of God's promises. And we find this in Abraham in verses 8 to 10 of Hebrews chapter 11. Allow me to read for you. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Brothers and sisters, at every point, Abraham responded to a promise of God with unwavering obedience at every point. That is the writer's chief point here in Hebrews chapter 11. We see this also in Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 to 3. And let me read again for you. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. Now, in this passage, God promised Abraham three things. A place, a posterity, and a prominence of a great name and universal Influence. Let's look at them in detail one by one. First, of these promises that Abraham met with unwavering expectation is the promise of an everlasting place. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, this is what it says. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. Now, brothers and sisters, let me go straight to the point. We see immediately the main object of Abraham's considerations when God called him. At the very outset, Abraham believed God and focused on God himself. Why did I say that? Because Abraham, he did not ask where to and what kind of place and people he was going to. He did not consider prevailing conditions or the environment of the place he was going to. How could he? when he has not even a hint of where he was going to. But Abraham did not question anymore. He obeyed immediately. Abraham went out from his country and brought all his possession and those closest to him. If you would care to read the account in Genesis. And notice his expectation also. He was not just expecting a piece of land, but he looked beyond earthly possessions and longed for the very city where God lives. 
let me point out that God never mentioned or never made any promise about heaven or his place where he lived. God never promised that to Abraham if you read the account in Genesis. And yet Abraham set his focus for God's dwelling place as his ultimate destiny. I believe that Abraham at 75 years old has seen and experienced enough of earthly life amidst man's sinfulness and the reality of the evil of his time. And that's why Hebrews chapter 11 verse 10 says that Abraham was now looking for the city which has the foundations whose architect and builder is God. This world is not our home. Brethren, God's word today reminds us to consider what inspires and motivates us today. Let us not be driven by money and material desires of those or like those without biblical faith. Are you like Abraham, a pilgrim and a stranger on this earth, driven and motivated by none other than God himself? That's what motivates and that is what inspires and drives Abraham, God himself. And God himself is our eternal inheritance presently and in the future. And the second is the promise of eternal posterity. This is the second of God's promises to him. And we find this in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, the first part where God says here, I will make you a great nation. And that's a promise of posterity. Now, what is posterity? Posterity means the descendants or heirs of a person. So in other words, God promised Abraham a posterity. He promised him descendants when he said, I will make you a great nation. But note that since the Genesis chapter 12 promise of a nation was spoken, nothing happened. Abraham was around 80 years old and living in Canaan, which is modern day Israel. Several events have taken place, but he had not yet received the fulfillment of this second promise of descendants of posterity. The birth of the son through whom the promised nation would begin. And Abraham hasn't received that promise yet. And he was now Eight years old. So when God appeared again to him in a vision in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham lifted up his thoughts and concern about God's promise of posterity to him, to which God reaffirmed his promise. And we find that in Genesis 15, verses 4 and 5. Let me read for you. Genesis chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. This is what it says. This man, because Abraham was saying, perhaps God, Eliezer, Eliezer, my relative, he will be the one that will uh, take over me. And God tells him, this man will not be your heir. But one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look 
towards the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Now what follows is a sentence. Listen to me, brothers and sisters, because what follows, verse 5, is a sentence that has become one of the most important sentences in the Bible. Since this sentence is quoted several times in the New Testament, this statement from Abraham that follows lays the foundation to understand the gospel and it reveals the way to everlasting life. Did you hear me? The sentence that follows reveals the way to eternal life. In Genesis 15 verse 6, the Bible tells us that Abraham said, or the Bible says, then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then Abraham believed in this promise of God and God said here that he credits it to Abraham as righteousness. Brothers and sisters, this statement elevated the promised descendants from the realm of human history to the realm of eternity. The promise of posterity and descendants are not merely physical now and human. They have now been elevated to the eternal plan of God. The posterity of Abraham were not just people of human history, but they are heirs of eternity. The church, we, the church, the people that God redeemed by faith in the promise. We are not just people of this world. We are not just people of this temporal existence. We are people of eternity. Amen. And I need to point out that Abraham was the first man considered by God. He was the first man that was considered by God as righteous because of faith. Everyone before him, Abel, Enoch, and Noah were never called righteous by God by faith. Abraham was the first one. He is the pattern and the prototype of God's righteousness by faith in God's word. God's promise, which is the Lord Jesus Christ for all mankind and all ages. The apostle Paul uses Abraham as his prime example of justification by faith alone, apart from the works. And we will find this in Romans chapter 4 and Galatians chapter 3 verses 6 to 8. He makes the startling assertion that it is not the Jews by physical birth. Are you hearing me? Paul makes a startling assertion that it is not the Jews by physical birth that are Abraham's descendants. Rather, those who believe in Christ are the true children of Abraham. Are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior by faith? then you are a true descendant of Abraham, the true heir of Abraham. Let me support this with a passage of scripture. In Romans chapter 4, verse 11, God's word says, and let me read for you, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised so that he might be the father of all who 
believe without being circumcised that righteousness might be credited to them. And here in Romans chapter 4, verse 11, we are told what circumcision really was during the time of Abraham. It was a confirmation of their righteousness by faith in the promise of God. That was the reason for the circumcision. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, let me add, it says here, Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Are you the son of Abraham by faith in the promise of God, the Lord Jesus Christ? Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. And if you belong to Christ, hear that. And if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's descendants. And not only descendants, it says here, heirs according to the promise. We have an inheritance. The blessings of Abraham are our inheritance. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The Apostle Paul identified Abraham as the ancestors of the Jews. He was the ancestor of the Jews. But Abraham is not the father of all the Jews. Do you understand me? Abraham is the father of all who believe in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? Amen? And today, if you are a believer of Jesus Christ, we are the real sons of Abraham. Not, not the Jewish nation. In a spiritual sense, we are the real descendants of Abraham. And this is what it means that Abraham is the father of those who believe in Jesus Christ. In this sense, it makes him our father and we are his heirs. Let me go to the third promise of God. The third is an unwavering expectation in the promise of enduring prominence. And in Genesis chapter 12, the second part of verse 2 on to verse 3, it says here, and God said to Abraham, and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and so you shall be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. This promise to Abraham was fulfilled through the physical descendants that became a mighty nation. The point of God's promise to make Abraham a blessing was further elaborated by God in Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, when he said, In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And this statement, this statement is God's announcing the coming of Christ, the Messiah. He is announcing the coming of Christ, the Messiah, in advance to Abraham in that phrase, in your seed. When God said, in your seed, he was making an advance announcement. You know, in the New Testament, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, it elaborates this by stating, and let me read for you, Galatians 3, 16, Now the promise were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one. And to your seed, that is, 
Christ. Notice how Galatians 3.16 is very specific about who that seed is. And Galatians says, that seed is Christ. And then in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, it affirms this truth also. And let me read it for you. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. And brothers and sisters, from, and from Christ would come from Christ. You know, Christ came from the descendants of Abraham, the nation of Israel. But from Christ would come the church. And that in turn would take the blessing to the whole world with the gospel. Today, it is the church. It is you and I, the heirs of Abraham who are the key, the instrument of God to bring the blessing of Abraham into all the world. We have a great task to fulfill, brothers and sisters, and God is with us. So the call and promises of God to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, is the hinge. And I have that on the slide. And I would like to show you this. It is the hinge of the Bible because upon it swings God's story of redemption. A hinge is made up of two interlocking pieces of metal. Think of Genesis chapter 1 to 11, as one piece of that hinge describing the creation and the fall of humanity. And Genesis chapter 12, through Revelation, all the way up to Revelation, as the other side of the hinge, describing how God brought about Israel and the first and second coming of Israel. Christ. And what connects them together? Abraham. Abraham is the pin that connects the two pieces together. And I pray that you understand the significance of Abraham's life. How did God describe biblical faith in Abraham? Well, God shows us that biblical faith first is an unwavering expectancy of God's promises. That's verse 8 to 10. But secondly, biblical faith is unwavering to embrace God's way to fulfill His promises. And we move on now to verse 11 to verse 16. Let me read. It says, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life. Since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man and him as good as dead at that. As many descendants as the stars of the heaven in numbers. And innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. And let me read up to that, okay? And we will proceed later on from verse 13 to verse 16. But there are two things here I would like you to see. First is, biblical faith embraces God's unusual approach to His promises. Biblical faith embraces God's unusual approach to his promises. And why do we say that? Because in verse 11 to 12 of Hebrews 11, we come to the second stage of Abraham's life of faith. And it now includes Sarah as well, if you will notice that. 
Although God gave Abraham an amazing promise of descendants that would grow into a nation that would bless many, but, 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 but the way he fulfilled it can be described as unreasonable, unnatural, and unbelievable. And that's how we can describe the way God fulfilled his promise to Abraham. It is unreasonable, unnatural, and unbelievable. Let me justify this description with facts as we go back to the account in Genesis. Fact number one, in Genesis 16, 11 years after God's initial promise, Sarai, apparently impatient, came up with a plan. It was Sarah who became impatient. And she came up with a plan for her husband, Abraham, to lay with his handmaiden, Hagar. And let me say, this was her, their way. Her way, along with Abraham, they devised a plan to help God. Could you imagine? They were trying to help God fulfill his promises so that God can bring about his promises. Hagar now bears a son and his name is called Ishmael, the father of the Arab people today. Fact number two, okay, why we say, you know, the fulfillment of God's plan is sometimes unnatural, it is unreasonable, and Unbelievable. Fact number two is in Genesis chapter 18. And this is now 13 years later and 24 years from Genesis chapter 12. Okay? Verse 3. When God promised to give Abraham a son. God reminds Abraham that he is going to give him a son. However, Abraham is now 99 years old when God asserted that promise and reminded that promise. And his wife, how old was Sarah? 90 years old. Now you remember that God now reduced the age of men to a hundred and twenty, and they are ninety-nine and ninety years old. They're old. Okay, they are more than senior citizen. Okay. In spite of these facts of their circumstances, they are forced to believe God. They are now forced. How could you not believe? Okay, you're ninety-nine and ninety years old, so. You're forced to good to believe God now concerning having a son by childbirth, considering their age. In verse 12, the phrase, as good as dead, is a medical term, meaning that medically, scientifically, and physically speaking, they are way past the age of childbearing. And brothers and sisters, do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like God putting your life on hold? Okay. From the time of the promise, 25 years, and nothing happened okay. until they were forced to help God. But that was not the plan of God. And that is what Abraham and Sarah must have felt like. For 25 years, they waited for the fulfillment of the promise. And as time went on, Abraham and Sarah passed the normal age of childbearing. Abraham knew God's promises and realizing that nothing had occurred, he asked if perhaps okay, his servant, Eliezer, was the one brought or the one through whom the promise would be fulfilled. You will find that in Genesis 15, verse 2 and 3. 
And let me say, brothers and sister, sisters, waiting is one of life's great disciplines. As we wait, we, it would do us well to remember an important principle. Waiting is never wasted time. As far as God is concerned, waiting for Him is never wasted wasted time. What is God doing while you, know, you wait? Well, God may be testing you to reveal how committed you really are, regardless of how it appears, God is always working behind the scenes, preparing the way. God is using life to position us and prepare us to accomplish his vision in our lives. You may have to wait, but remember that God's timing is always right. True faith is waiting for the fulfillment of God's promises and God's timing. And as we continue, scripture tells us that by faith, after some struggles with their human reasoning and their weaknesses of the, the flesh, they both believe God and His unorthodox ways. Once again, let's listen to Hebrews 11, verse 11 now. It says here, By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive. I hope you did not miss that. It says, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive and beyond the proper time of life since she considered him faithful who had promised. And so in Hebrews 11, we are told, Sarah has also come around to look unto God by faith. Here's the evidence here in verse 11. In verse 12, it says, Therefore, there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead. At that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. The tremendous rewards of biblical faith, of walking by faith. And in the New Testament, listen to Romans 4, 19, as it observes this. It says, without weakening in his faith, he, referring to Abraham, faced the fact that his body was as good as dead and that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver. Yet, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. Biblical faith is unwavering belief in God and his promises. Amen. We must not minimize Sarah from God's highlighting of those who triumph by faith faith because she is included here in Hebrews 11 even though she laughed incredulously when she overheard God's promise to Abraham that she would bear a son in Genesis 18 verse 11 to 12 nevertheless God helped her incredulity with the question is anything too hard for the Lord those challenging words would have surely have been the source of her constant meditation in the days that followed. And Genesis chapter 21 verse 1 states, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. We must take to heart that God's unusual and unreasonable methods for fulfilling His promises is to awaken and develop biblical faith in us whom He called. God said, the righteous shall live by faith. And God said in Hebrews eleven six, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. Brethren in Christ, in these times of difficulty and threat of the pandemic, it pays so much to be reminded that there is nothing too hard for the Lord. And we need to be reminded and encouraged that God had given us precious and magnificent promises so that even when circumstances seem to be impossible and against our human reasoning, we must be unwavering to embrace God, grab hold of His Word, and believe that He has His own way of fulfilling His promises to us in Christ Jesus. And Abraham was promised a land to live in. But he never possessed it. He was promised a great nation, but he never saw it. He was promised a prominence, but he never enjoyed it. Abraham never saw God's promises fully, fully fulfilled in his lifetime, but he saw it from afar. Amen? As someone wrote a long time ago, he said, many things about tomorrow. I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. The second thing I would like us to see here is biblical faith embraces God's unrealized aspects of his promises. That's what Abraham did. The unrealized aspects of God's promises, the full fulfillment of God's promises that Abraham has not experienced. He embraces it by faith. And not only him, but his children, his descendants. Listen to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 to 16, before we move to our last point. All these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on earth, for those who say such thing, make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, or in other words, if they were thinking of going back to the country where they came from, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Brothers and sisters, in Christ we may not be able to get instant or immediate answers from God for all our earthly problems, but we can welcome them from a distance as we look beyond this life. We must not lose faith that God will fulfill his every promise. If not here, then it will be in the hereafter. Let's go to our last point. How did God describe biblical faith in Abraham? Well, we said God shows us that biblical faith is an unwavering, is an unwavering expectation of God's promises. Second, biblical faith is, an un, is unwa unwavering to embrace God's way of fulfilling His promises. And lastly, biblical faith is unwavering to execute God's exacting process or processes. And we find that in verse 17 to 19. It says here, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he, had, he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. 
It was he whom it was said, in Isaac, your descendant shall be called. And he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Now here, brothers and sisters, having expanded our understanding of the faith of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the author of Hebrews 11 brings us to the most difficult test of Abraham's faith and its most glorious triumph as well. And what is that? The sacrifice of Isaac. And we see this, in, we saw this in verse 17 to 19. As we understand the details of this story in Genesis chapter 22 verses 1 to 10, we could not help but wonder, how could a righteous and holy God demand for such a sacrifice? It makes no sense because of the following reasons. Isaac was the only fulfillment of the promise. This is the meaning of his only begotten son in verse 17. Ishmael, yes, was also a son of Abraham, but only Isaac was the son of promise. It is so out of character of God to put such a demand on his servant. It likely, I could just imagine, it likely brought deep anguish to Abraham in his old age for God to ask him to sacrifice his only son, the son of promise. What could he have felt? We must ask. And imagining that he himself, by his, own hand, by his own hands, would slay. Could you imagine? Just imagining that he himself, by his own hands, would slay his son, his beloved son, in a bloody sacrifice. And afterwards, burn him on the altar. I beg your pardon if those offend your sensitivities. But ours is not to question God or doubt him in his ways. Our purpose is to get to know him more intimately as we give careful consideration to the revelation of his word today in our passage. So, brethren, consider Abraham's unwavering execution in God's exacting process. The first thing I would like, there are three things that I would like us to consider before we end. The first is consider the speed of Abraham's obedience. Noteworthy is Abraham's immediate obedience. No arguing, no hesitation, no bargaining, no reminding God how long he and Sarah had waited. Instead, Abraham got up early, saddled up his donkey, and headed out. To obey. And you find that in verse 3 of Genesis 22. It says, So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And the second thing I would like us to consider here is the surety of his confidence. In Genesis 22, verse 5, once again, let me read for you. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship, and listen to this, and return to you. This indicates that Abraham completely trusted God's promise in Hebrews 11, verse 18 to make Isaac into a great nation. He believed that promise. That's why he was able to say to his servant, stay here and we will return. We will just worship there, but we will return here. He didn't entirely understand, but how was he confident that both he and Isaac would come down the mountain? Verse 19 of Hebrews 11 says, let me read for you, he considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. Abraham believed. 
Even if God will allow him to slay his own son, God will be able to raise up Isaac again to fulfill his promise to make Isaac a great nation. And lastly, consider the submission of Isaac. We need to consider that, brothers and sisters. We need to consider the submission of Isaac. We should not overlook the faith of Isaac. You, young people, Consider the reverence and submission of Isaac to his father Abraham. He did not engage in an argument nor fought against the obviously irrational behavior of his father, but he humbly submitted himself. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 12, the second part, God tells us the reason why he tested Abraham. He said, For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Brothers and sisters, let me state, God tested Abraham to find out if he has the right kind of faith. God wants to see if Abraham's faith matches the enormity of the blessings of God's eternal promises to him in Christ. And let me say also, this testing of his faith and obedience at this point of his life was not and no longer new to Abraham. It was no longer new to Abraham. And brothers and sisters, it should never be a surprise to us if we are walking faithfully before God and God tests us. Abraham once again proved his faith by his willingness to give back to God what was most precious in his heart, his son of promise, Isaac. With all due respect, permit me to ask you, brethren, does all this make good sense to you? What is the most important thing in your life today? And who takes first place in your heart at this time? To some of us, me included, money might be first place in our life. And we might be withholding what rightfully belongs to God. God is not interested with our money. Let me say that he is interested in our hearts. Did you hear me? For some of us, perhaps the most important thing is our family. For others, it might be your career, your dreams for the future. If you are afraid to trust God regarding your possessions, your dreams, or someone special in your life, then you need to take a look at the life of Abraham. God's difficult test on Abraham teaches us that he will never, listen to me, God will never settle for being second place in our life. God is only interested in being first place in our life and he will not settle for anything less. When Abraham proved his heart before God, God said, it is enough. And as I come to our closing thoughts, in Abraham, God describes biblical faith as an unwavering belief in God and his promises. You know, I read a story of a man walking in the desert. He miscalculated the distance of his trip and his food provisions ran out. He was especially thirsty because his water container was empty and he came upon an old wooden house almost in ruins. And he walked in and sat down to rest. Then he saw this old hand pump in one corner of the house. He went over and started pumping as hard as he could, but all he got was squeaking sounds and dust. And he walked back and sat down frustrated. While looking around, he saw a bottle and a note attached to that bottle. And the note read, 
you have to use all the water in the bottle to prime the pump. And the note emphasized the word all. You have to use all the water in the bottle to prime the pump. Now, he is confronted with a decision. Should he drink the water in the bottle or should he take a chance and do as the note instructed? He decided to follow as the note read, but only partially, thinking he could drink what was left. He poured in some and began to pump, but all he got was the familiar squeaking and a few droplets of water. And then he quickly, he quickly poured in the rest of the water from the bottle and began pumping as hard as he can. And soon, there was all the water he could want. And he drank and he began to fill his container and he filled the water bottle before he left. And he added to the note, he added to the note, it really works, but you have to believe the instruction all the way. We who have trusted in God's promise, our promises in Christ are the fulfillment of the promised posterity of Abraham. As true heirs of Abraham by faith in Christ, we are blessed with the blessings of Abraham so we can bless people and nations with every spiritual blessings we have received in Christ. And so in conclusion, Abraham's faith was credited to him by God as righteousness shows us the faithfulness of God who gives us great confidence till the end. There is no other way to live in order to be useful and fruitful for God's glory but to live by faith. In God and in his promises through Christ. And we need to live by faith all Before I end, perhaps you have never started yet in a life of faith because you have not yet started faith in Christ Jesus to make him as your Lord and Savior. If you understood our lesson, Abraham was the beginning of God's salvation by faith. And Abraham points to Christ Jesus. So today, have you made Christ your Savior and Lord of your life? If you cannot answer that with confidence, may I ask you, do you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? If this is your desire, let me ask you first, do you admit you are a sinner and that you cannot save yourself by your own good works and good deeds? If you say yes, may I ask you one more question? Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? If your answer is yes, do you want to receive him as your Lord and Savior in a short prayer? If you do, then pray with me. Pray with me right now. Yes, pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your truth. Today, I recognize and admit before you, I am a sinner. I cannot save myself by my own effort and good deeds. And because of your truth in your word, Lord Jesus, I ask forgiveness for my sins and I surrender my life to you and recognize you as my Savior. I believe you died on the cross.
cross for my sins and rose again from the dead to prove that you are the Savior. And today, Lord, I submit my whole being to you and recognize you as my Lord from this time on. Help me to follow you. Guide me on how to live my life. This is my faith, my prayer. Amen. Amen. If you pray that prayer, you are now a child, an heir, a descendant of Abraham and heirs of the blessings of Abraham and the promises of God in Christ. For the rest of us, let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your word today. Thank you for once again encouraging us and teaching us the value of biblical faith and a walk of faith. In the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of the challenges of the difficulties and the uncertainties of our time, help us to walk by faith. In the midst, Lord, of whatever we are struggling with, Lord, and whatever we are confronted with in circumstances or even the weaknesses of our flesh, help us to look unto you in faith. Father, may our life be pleasing to you as we walk by faith. Thank you, Lord, for your message. May your words continue, Lord, to echo in our hearts, Lord. May they become wisdom for our life and daily living as we walk in full confidence and faith in your promises, in your word. Once again, we return to you all glory and praises and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.